an equity perspective, the cumulative impact of the second lockdown on the members that you represent, how is that looking in, uh, different compared to the first lockdown? I mean, I think for uh, members in theatre and variety, they'd say, well, we're still on the first lockdown because the vast majority of them never went back to work. Um, and the, the nature of the question itself almost begs the answer where you say, well, well how many redundancies do we have? Well, well, you know, barely any because our members are entirely freelance. They don't have um, that recourse. They were not um, retained on the furlough scheme. Um, and 40% of our 48,000 members haven't received a single penny from either furlough or the self-employed income support scheme um, since March. So for them, there was really no um, second lockdown. There was just the first. And even when you look at the sort of limited lifting of restrictions, there's been a complete lack of understanding from the government um, about the economics of reopening our members' workplaces. You're not going to be able to reopen a theatre um, based on the marketised model that the government has set up through its um, funding structure, and indeed successive governments have set up through their funding structures, um, unless you allow people to open very small bars, unless you allow them to have very full houses, um, and unless you have um, you know, audiences who are disproportionately um, older, disproportionately in the shielding groups. Um, and, and indeed, if you look at the um, understanding of how the industry closed in the first place, we're looking at major West End shows, so very, very commercial, profitable instances. One in particular, which I can think of, it's the Thursday before the theatre lockdown, which was a week before national lockdown, um, was taking £2,000 that day. Um, it normally takes £60,000 a day. So there's been a complete lack of understanding from the government about the level of investment that's required to ramp up the industry back to a level of anything that looks like normality. You have the government's £1.57 billion that's not just for us, but it's for um, heritage and cultural institutions across the board, museums, galleries, um, you know, historic sites and, and, and so on. Um, a quarter of a billion pounds of which is unspent because organisations were hinted at in many instances to not use that money on uh, making provisions for reopening. Those that did make provisions to reopen literally had the carpet ripped out from under them um, with a very, very short notice um, about closure, not just nationally, but also let's talk about those regional lockdowns, which had a massive effect on um, the, uh, our members' workplaces and producers who'd engaged in good faith with making their um, venues COVID secure, um, and then the consequent impact of that. So I can't really answer in terms of redundancies because in short, um, with a, I mean, 20% of self-employed uh, people in this country are working in the creative industries. Although our union agreements provide severance payments and levels of protection um, for the majority of people who are working on them, the conventional redundancy situation doesn't apply and the self-employed income support scheme has been woefully inadequate since its inception. Understood. Thank you for that. And Henry... And Paul, if you could make yours uh, very brief, if your point hasn't been already covered by others. So if you want some very specific things that could be done, we could introduce a floor for the self-employed income support scheme below, which nobody can fall. So we can say that people take the best three years of their past five tax years and allow people that don't have five tax years of records um, to choose less than those three years. We could remove the requirement to prove that you earn the majority of your income from being self-employed. Um, and as a consequence, that would mean that our members who have ancillary jobs from which they can't be furloughed um, can, uh, can, can receive that money. And at the other end, then we should uh, remove the cap. The, um, if you're over £50,000, then you're excluded from support entirely and introduce a sort of proportionate cap as they do with the furlough scheme. Straightforwardly with the industry itself, um, that quarter of a billion pounds um, uh, that, that, that's left over should be spent on a safe opening stimulus in a targeted way in um, conversation with other areas of the economy. So our industry is supporting um, other businesses, other organisations um, to get up and get to work. And they should look seriously at the introduction of a comprehensive insurance system for both um, uh, for, for, for the theatre sector, as the government has done to their credit to, with success in TV and film. Um, but ensuring that it is comprehensive in terms of covering older workers um, and disabled workers. Um, and then finally, um, seriously look at the creation of what we'd call a national portfolio of artists. So instead of just funding organisations, look at you know, really, really important, and particularly in, in parts of the world like the North East, where we have an awful lot of uh, people who are working as variety artists, that's people in pubs and clubs, children's entertainers and so on, to mean that they are eligible to apply for public funding for their work and that that work is not just open to big institutions that have those normal tie-ins with government. So those are some very simple, very practical and actually very cheap things the government could do to include more people and stimulate our industry. Thanks, Paul. If I could just move across...